It's time for another episode of The Sean Tabbitt Show, a podcast where I connect you with thought leaders from across the globe, dig into some of my favorite topics like personal development, marketing, spirituality, and pretty much any other shiny object that happens to catch my attention. Today, my very special guest is my friend Jojo Morris, and we are going to be talking about his near-death experience. Jojo, I've enjoyed getting to know you the past uh, couple of months with our Afterlife, in conference, uh, our Afterlife Conference. We have friends in common. Uh, so I'm excited to finally bring you on to my own show. So welcome to the Sean Tabbitt Show. Wow. Thanks so much for having me, Mr. Sean. This is such a pleasure to speak, and I pray that people are blessed today. Well, uh, you know, I can say after going down the NDE afterlife rabbit hole this past year, uh, no matter whose story we share, people are impacted. Uh, Randy and I get letters all the time from people who they're getting saved, they're getting delivered from being suicidal, they're getting healed. Uh, I never quite know what God's going to do, how the Holy Spirit's going to drop, sometimes in an interview, but often when people are just watching uh, watching or listening to these, you know, having friends in uh, all spaces of Christian media, uh, you know, it's not uncommon to get a letter or an email or a, me- a, a, a message, even five, six years, 10 years after content airs. And somebody be like, when you interviewed so-and-so, that prayer they prayed, that was for me. And so... You know, wrap your head around God using content that was produced wow. five years ago, ten years ago, to like bring a tangible transformation to somebody uh, in the future. Literally, from you know, God's outside of time, so He can He can, He can do that. So, uh, you know, I'm eager to see what God will do with our time today. We might find out next week when this airs. We might find out ten years from now. I'm like Jojo, I just got this email about our video. Who knew? Who knew? So, uh, we we look forward to seeing how y'all are impacted by this conversation. Uh, but I think the place I'd love to start is just. Have you kind of set the stage? I always feel like it's really helpful when we're talking about somebody who's having a an afterlife experience, a near-death experience, uh, to kind of paint the picture of, of who you were, kind of family background, faith background, worldview. Just give us context for, for who you were, uh, stage of life uh, before uh, your near-death encounter. What, what did that look like on that side before you crossed the veil, so to speak? Absolutely love this question. Thank you so much. And uh, I love that. We are making an investment into eternity to kick this off. Um, my name is Jojo. Uh, my original name is Joe, but since birth, I've been called Jojo. And so it starts for me back in 1995 when I was born, born in Texas, into a mainstream American family. Uh, there's eight of us uh, children in total. I have uh, four sisters and three other brothers. So that makes four boys, four girls. And growing up, we lived a very, very quiet life. We went shopping regularly every single week. Um, but my parents are truth seekers and I love this about them. And so at the age of five, we found ourselves in living in Oklahoma at this time. We moved around quite a bit during those early years. So I'm five years old. My mom is going to this homeschool convention and she meets up with a group of people called the Mennonites. And we found the, you know, the 1% of the 99% of Mennonites. We found the strictest group of the Mennonites. I love the Mennonites. They're such a dear people group to me. And so when I refer to the Mennonites, I do not want this to be a blanket statement. I'm referring to a small little group in Oklahoma. They were selling their own school curriculum. And it was quite unique because they were homeschooling all their children, but they were also selling this literature that they were getting from these publishers. And we were fascinated. My mom was fascinated. She started asking lots of questions. Why do you sell your own clothes? Why do you grow your own food? Why do you guys not watch TV? Um, How come you, you know, drive playing cars? Like what's going on? Evidently, Within six months, like my parents liked the answers and as actually shorter than six months, almost three months into knowing these people, we started, we joined their home church. And so at the age of five, I'm brought into this whole new culture that was night and day from my, um, my original life. We had originally would have movie nights every Friday night. Our grandparents and relatives would come over regularly to visit us and see us and give us gifts and all that stuff that grandparents love to do. But when we joined this small group in Oklahoma, everything was pretty much cut off. And it was quite a bit of a shock because my mom started sewing her own clothes. We started growing our own food. And those things are wholesome and good. But the religious spirit that we joined was very, very fearful. We were scared of the end times. We were scared that, you know, what if we're not faithful? What if God is going to judge us for something wrong? And so from the age of five on, I was raised in a very, very fearful mindset. And it was um, sort of talking about, a beautiful thing, yet it had a lot of dark stuff in it. So from that young age, I started having night paralysis. I started having demonic attacks at night. I regularly wet the bed, um, was living on a farm at the time as a young boy. And we moved 
all over the U.S. So we ended up moving from Oklahoma to Pennsylvania, then back to Oklahoma. So at this time, so I apologize if I confuse anybody with where we were living, but we moved around a lot, hopping from one church to the next. And I grew up to to believe that God was a God that was to be feared, and that yes, Jesus is loving. We need to you know Jesus is our personal savior, but God, He's a fearful God. You do not want to fall underneath the wrath of Almighty God. And so my my early childhood was full of a lot of uh, unnecessary whippings. It was uh, the rod of correction was overzealous, and um, you know looking back now, it's I see my parents' heart, but unfortunately, there was quite a bit of abuse that was happening. And now I'm turning 12, 13, and I'm having incredible struggles with anger. I'm having, I'm lashing out at my siblings. I'm beating up things in our farm that should not be beat up. And I would go punch hay bales just to get my wrath out. And so I started spiraling into this like um, hatred spirit. And during that time, um, I had an awful relationship with my younger brother and we were threatening to kill each other. And it was really, it was not good. And when I was 14, I had a friend tell me, like, dude, you need to get your life straight. Like, if you don't figure out how to, like, reconcile this relationship, you're both are going to be worst enemies your whole entire life. So shortly after that, I gave my life to Jesus. I was like, I need to get my life straight. And I immediately felt a change in my life. I became so joyful because I'm like, I'm going to go to heaven now. I um, originally became born again because I was scared of going to hell. But then once I gave my life to Jesus, I was like, wait, Jesus loves me. This I know, for the Bible tells me so. And I became so overzealous that people were like, like dude, put on the brakes. Jojo, you were way too excited. Um, you, were, you were way too charismatic for this. And I was like a pink unicorn. I was uh, letting my true personality out. And during that time, it was, a, it, was, it was like a ton of joy in my heart, but yet I was being pushed down by the community. And they were saying, be careful lest you get cold. Be careful lest pride gets into your heart. Like pride comes before a fall. And I was like, just trying to tell people about Jesus. And I distinctly remember there was quite a few uh, fights happening in our home at the time. And I would, as a teenager, I would just get so discouraged. I just run out of the house and I would go into our greenhouse and lay in the flower beds. We had these flowers and I would, the butterflies would come and land on my nose. And it was so healing for me as a teenager to have like this place of solace, this place of rest. But yet when I'd go back into the house, there'd be arguments happening and church standards that we were all fighting over. And it was just really a mess. So I'm turning 15, 16, and I go hardcore religious. I'm hitting people on the head with the Bible. And when when I turned 18, we moved to this colony up in Minnesota. Like I said, we moved around a lot. And I absolutely love this community because they were actually, they were actually called the Hutterites. And so they're a, a different group. Of, they're different than Mennonites because they have everything in common. So now we lived in this village. But unfortunately, my parents did not fit in. And us children quickly integrated. I'm a, I'm a teenager now. I'm 18 years old. I quickly integrated, found my place, got into the workforce, really started providing for the community. But I noticed there was like this bipolar relationship happening because I'd go to home. It was really very upsetting to be at the house. But yet I'd always want to be at work because work is where I found my peace. And so I had this unhealthy relationship with work for the longest time. And mind you, we do not make our own money. If we needed to go to town, we had to ask permission for a car because we did not own our own cars. And we had to have a personal accountability partner. So I turned 19 and we, we love winter sports. We never participated in town sports because that was of the world. That was very demonic. You know, never listen to the radio, never listen to anything with the beat. So we made our own hockey rink as, as farm boys. And um, excuse me. So we made our own hockey rink. We flooded it. It's like 30 below in Minnesota. It was beautiful. We're out there practicing one, one day. And I, my friend was bringing my helmet. And I didn't really think of anything about it. But someone there was visiting from out of town. And they were very overzealous. Unfortunately, that person slap shot at a hockey puck and it went right into my mouth. It was a freak accident. But at that time, my theology was that if you got hurt or if you got sick, it was because you did something wrong and God was judging you. And so now I'm sitting on the ice. I'm standing there with my face punched in, teeth are in the back of my throat, and I'm thinking that Almighty God has judged me. And that started a year-long weekly doctor visit. I had to go to visit the doctors every single week, and I had a miracle healing. I almost lost my lower lip. I had a really bad cut that almost took out my lower lip. They would have had to sew it together. It would just deformed everything. 
And I ended up only losing two teeth, which is an absolute miracle because God has given me a beautiful smile and only one tooth is fake. <laughs> and, but to sort of wrap you back into that, I'm, I'm happy now, but I got to tell you, the fear I felt was terrorizing. The fear I felt was paralyzing. And during that time, I was writing a lot of music. And we were not allowed to listen to contemporary Christian worship at that, that time because it was demonically. We were told it was demonically inspired. So I'd write music, and I was teaching the choir. I was a youth pastor at that time, helping co-lead among some other leaders and being groomed to become an elder in the church because I was very zealous, like Saul in the Bible. And I would teach the choir this music. And then a couple of weeks later, the elders would pull me into this meeting and say, why did you teach this music to the choir? It's demonically inspired. Stop writing this music. And I'm writing hymns. And it just did not make sense to me. So every time I would write something that I knew God wanted me to write, I'd get slapped on the face with it. And so I felt like God was playing with me. Not only did he judge me by punching me in the face with a hockey punk, now he's judging me by having my home life so chaotic. Plus, I'm getting slapped on the wrist for every single song I produce and write. And it was a very dark time. I went into a period of uh, time which I would call my, my mind comp, my inner fight, my dark night of the soul. And I spiraled into dark, dark depression. I did not want to live. I did not want to exist anymore. I was forcing myself to eat. But on the outside, I was like, ah, you know, like smiling and just cheering up everybody. But on the inside, I was lifeless, just going through the motions. So one day, it was, it was a cold winter night. I had worked a long day, 12-hour day. And I came home and there was a raging argument going on in on. There was a raging arg argument going on in our house. Stumbling over my words here. Apologize. And I tried to slip into my room, but I was confronted. And my father's like, Jojo, why are you writing this music? It's ruining our marriage. The fact that you're writing these songs is causing this, 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 uh, this argument as you're seeing it. And I was so disgusted. I was so discouraged. I went into my room. I slammed the door. I grabbed the pillow. And I said, God, why did you make me? I don't want to live and I cuss God out. I was so upset. I was so upset at the creator for placing me on this earth because I felt like everything I did was worth nothing. I was, I was wasting space. And it's a very desperate place to be. And I said, God, if you don't show me what I'm here for, I don't want to be here anymore. Give him an ultimatum. So a week later, just going through my everyday schedule, we had a very rigid schedule. Because in a community, without a schedule, you fail. And so we're just going through the motions, you know, 30 minute by hour segments. We're very, very, very structured. So I go to my, take a three o'clock break. I set my timer for 29 minutes and I lay on my, I lay on my bed for my three o'clock nap. And the moment I laid on my bed, I felt my neck snap. And it was a paralyzing feeling that swept over my body. I could not move. And moments later, I saw the back of my head. I started hyperventilating. Because I was now in spirit form, yet I could see everything crystal clear. I realized that I could go through things. My hand would phase through my, my desk. And I, I, I tried to get back into my body, but it didn't work. And so in a panic rush, I just ran out my door. Not my door. I ran out, um, did not run out the door. I ran out my wall and treated it as a door. And I just sort of felt this light wind as the sheetrock passed through me. And I was outside. And I started yelling at this lady that was going to the wash house in the center of the colony. Help, help, help. My body's in the room. It's, it's, it's not breathing. And she couldn't hear me. Her eyes were glazed over. She had a baby on her hip and she was pulling a cart of laundry. And I remember thinking to myself, like, she can't hear me. And then someone walked through me. And I'm thinking, I am a spirit. And at that time, it felt like a cheese grater on my mind because my senses became so sharp. I could hear miles away. I could hear a car starting. It sounded like miles away. I could hear children laughing at a great distance off. And I started thinking to myself, oh, God. This is too much for me to bear. And at that moment of desperation, an angel showed up and said this, this one line, it is time for judgment. And I remember thinking to myself, okay, well, I'm trapped out of my body. I know I'm dead because I looked at my body and was not breathing. And I remember thinking to myself, okay, it's time for judgment. I am definitely not doing anything here on earth. So I, I agreed to leave with him. And this angel is glowing. It's like getting a light bulb and making it illuminate everything in your body. It was insane. And so we started going away from earth. And right as we started lifting off the earth, I immediately started recognizing the fight between um, good and evil. And I saw demonic forces sweeping across the earth, thousands and thousands of demons that were just fighting over the territories of this earth. And there was these light beams that were shooting up. And I knew that those light beams was the good that God had placed on this earth. And 
they recognized me. The demons recognized me and they said, Jojo, don't go with him. Come with us. And they were crying out with these raspy, strained voices. It sounded like they had been smoking for a thousand years. It was the most bone chilling voice I've ever heard. And I remember thinking, no, I'm not going with them. I never verbally said anything to them, but I remember thinking, I am not going with them. And I clung all the more to this, I will leave this earth type of uh, feeling. Moments later, after we passed these levels, my body collided into a wall of water. And why I hit a wall of water, I do not know. But there was a distinct transition between the atmosphere of earth and where I was going. And so now I'm suspended in this wall of water. The angel's in front of me. And he's a shredded warrior angel. Huge guns like Psalms says his God's mighty arms are wrapped around you, protecting you. This angel had mighty arms. And he says, he looks straight at me and says, you must release all the air that is within you because what you have inside you cannot take to where we're going. And I remember thinking to myself, why is he telling me to surrender like this? It was a, it was a complete surrender. I could not take these feelings of being attached to earth with me. And I fought it for a while. I struggled. I fought, but I finally surrendered. Okay. I will give up this attachment I have of earth. Right after I surrendered, we were transformed this wall, through this wall of water and below us was the throne room. And it was insane. The glory was shining. I had to like literally shield my eyes because it was so bright. And we started descending rapidly. Moments later, we touched down on the throne room. The first thing I see is a tile at my feet. There's hundreds of these tiles. But the one I saw at my foot was about 12 by 12. And it was like an artist had spent hours, possibly hundreds of hours, creating a clear epoxy covered artwork that was like jewels suspended in rosin and these flowers that would come out and you could see it it was like virtual artwork but yet that was the floor of the throne room and i looked to my right and i just see a sea of angels solemn faces no expressions my angel my the angel that took me from earth is now standing next to me i look to my left and to my shock i see god and i knew in my spirit it was god because his face shone brighter than the sun like it says in revelations his face shone brighter than the sun but he was sitting on his throne and he was drinking out of a coffee mug. And in my religious mind, I was thinking, why is the creator of earth sitting on a throne doing nothing? And I raged against him. That anger boiled back up again. And I'm ashamed. That's how much pride I had in my heart at that time. Moments later, a surround sound voice booms. And it says, let judgment begin. And that like sent chills to my body. Right after that, those that surround sound, surround sound voice came out of everywhere. Big three hologram screens popped up, and I saw my life plain from the very beginning. When I was born in Lake Dallas, Texas, my parents were holding this little infant, ah, oh, this little JoJo, you know, and and then that was about the only good memory because what I saw in my life was only the religious spirit that I had participated in all those years, and it was not good. I saw how I mistreated my siblings. I saw all these bad things that were happening. And growing up in my, my 12, 13, 14-year-old years, I saw how angry I was. And my life kept speeding up when we were moving around a lot. And then we moved to Minnesota. And then I saw myself working long hours in the shop. And we had a huge farm accident and burned down one of our shops. And I watched all that happen. And I remember thinking to myself, like, I can't believe this was my life. And it was not good. I saw myself go take that nap and I started just inside. I was like, no, no, do not lay down because I knew that was the end. And the moment I heard my neck snap, all of a sudden the screens folded up and went away. And that was it. Moments later. And by, by the way, the whole entire time I'm watching my life, it felt like a day or two was passed. Like I saw so many details. It would take me hours to explain that. But for the sake of time, it felt like a day or two just watching that first time around. A surround sound voice comes, comes out of everywhere and it says, is his name in the book of life? And I'm thinking, oh no, because in Revelations it says, if your name is not in the book of life, you are cast out. And I knew very clearly that the word of God was ringing within me. I'm a student of the word. And so everything I'm seeing is lining up with scripture. And this angel next to me is holding this huge book of names. And he starts reading through them all and I don't hear my name. And it goes on and on and on and on. Hear these names like Daniel, Kaylin, Jessica, Hannah, Rebecca, all these, all these different names. Some people that I knew, some people that I didn't. And I was thinking about claiming a name, but I knew I could not be dishonest. Like I'm resolving again. That same surrender that I had when I left the earth, I had to do it again in the throne room. And all of a sudden, and that moment of surrender, 
I hear the name Jojo. And like my hair stands up on the edge of like my arms. And all of a sudden, God jumps off the throne and he's standing right in front of me. He says, Jojo, I am here to show you who I truly am. This whole time you thought I was a judgmental, hateful, fearful God, but that is not who I am. And he basically just stripped everything away from like my old thinking, just took it away. And he said, this is how I see you. And he started my life from the very beginning. And he showed me that when I was born in Texas, my parents told me that how he viewed my life, the lenses, which he saw me was good, good, good. And he showed me when I gave my sibling a glass of water one time, when I helped our neighbor harvest, you know, their trees. And then I, they had peach trees and then another person had cherry trees. And I would go volunteer my work for them. And then he would also show me all the times to share the love of God with people. And he, he just showed me that all these moments he adored and he took personal interest in it. And I remember thinking to myself, like, who is this God that he would take this much time to look into my life? And then he, then he showed me those dark years where I slipped into depression. And he showed me that he felt every single whipping that I felt. He felt every single moment of desperation, every moment of loneliness. I, he felt that he felt the mountain of shame for wetting my bed for over 20 years. He felt all of that. He felt the pain of me going through celiac and getting these allergic rashes with gluten intolerance. He felt all that. He bore it with me. And I, I was thinking to myself, who is this that he would bear my pain? And he said, Jojo, you will no longer bear this. You will no longer feel this. And he just shot me with this like virtual hug. And it was like this crazy rainbow that hit me. And I looked down and I started seeing hatred, bitterness, all the insecurities I felt lying and just all this stuff just started flying off of me. And God's just removing that from me. I saw a new man being created. And I started weeping. And I started thinking to myself, like, I will never have a night terror again. I will never feel hate for someone ever again. I will only feel love. I started weeping, knowing that God was renewing me. And I looked down and as these tears would fall, they wouldn't hit the ground. And I looked up through my tears. I said, God, why aren't my tears hitting the ground? He reminded me. And in in Psalms, it says, he catches our tears and puts them in a bottle. God spoke to me and said, I've caught every single one of your tears that has fallen. And I've kept them. And I remember thinking to myself, he never lets our tears hit the floor. Now, on earth, we can see them. But God keeps account of every single one. And that's the type of God he was. And he still is today. And so that moment of glory, I look up. And as this is happening, I'm seeing all the angels around me sing glory, glory, and honor to your name. Praise be the lamb that was slain. You know, may reign forever and ever for all eternity. And they were just praising the king of kings. And they were praising the father. And I remember thinking to myself, this is nuts. This heaven is a roaring party. And they were shooting rocket launchers off. And it was crazy. And I'm like, this is, un- I was getting uncomfortable with how crazy they were celebrating because this booming music was sweeping across the whole entire, the throne room was about the size of a bit bigger than a stadium. And there was, I could not count the angels. There was too many to count, but they were all were celebrating over one lost sinner that had come home. And that was me. And I remember thinking, like, it felt so good to be forgiven. I knew God loved me unconditionally at this point. Well, it, it sounds like uh, God was breaking all, all of your paradigms in in a moment. Just like the, uh, in terms of uh, the music and sort of just the partying, how irreligious and irresponsible, <laughs> you know, just going against everything you were really raised in. Um, you know, God revealing himself as... Uh, somebody who sees you with just the eyes of a father who loves you and, um, you know, just really taking away the, uh, the evil tyrant father, God, that you, you thought, you know, there's just the, the religious God that, that you were taught yeah. was, was who he was. So I love, yeah. I love, I love that. He's just ripping, ripping off all the bad, bad lenses and bad paradigms and just, you know, really, uh, redeeming your worldview, giving you a new worldview and new eyes to see who he really was yeah. and who that, that the true um, true representation of who you are is who he sees you to be through his eyes, not, yeah. not through who you perceived yourself to be. Yeah. And he showed me that like he had formed me in my mother's womb. He showed me that I was a beloved son of the King. And he showed me right after that and the party and still happening told me that he wants me to study his word and to learn music. And those two things brought so much joy into my heart. And at that moment, I realized that God 
will have us doing something that we love for eternity. And it takes away the sucking on a lollipop with a ring around your head, floating on a cloud thing. That is not happening. I'm so sorry to pop, pe- pop people's bubbles and what they think is going to happen in heaven. Heaven is the realest thing that is out there. And what we see now is only a vague shadow of what's to come. And to close this up, I had this overwhelming joy that sweep over me that made me want to cry, laugh, just jump like a little child. I started discovering things in heaven in the throne room. It was a, a wide gate that opened up into the kingdom of God. And it was this huge hill that had this fine manicure uh, grass. And I was assigned a woman angel. And my, I realized that the angel that took me from earth was my guardian angel because he was telling God about when I hit puberty and all those developing years. And he's told God all these personal things about me. And God's like just fascinated, locked in on all this information. And God's like, okay, so what happened next? And the guardian angel would tell him, you know, I was discovering myself. And God's like, yep, that's how I made it. That's that's perfect. That was perfect timeline. That's exactly what was supposed to happen at that moment. I'm thinking to myself, like, everything's in the open. God sees everything. And he's unashamed to rejoice in his creation. And I remember just like, who is this? And I remember at that moment, I realized that God was truly omnipresent. And he takes that personal vested interest in every single one of our lives. And we're going to find out even in a greater length when we actually go and spend time with the Lord and in, 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 for eternity. So moments later, after walking into the kingdom of God, there was these lessons that were popping up and I was learning music theory. And it was the most insane thing because I was learning the beginning concepts. Five part harmony, God showed me that we had an indefinite range to compose with, which was mind blowing. 10-part harmony, even a bigger range to compose with instead of our usual four-part harmony here on earth. And then right as I was getting getting ready to hear, I heard this huge city being built on the other side of this hill. Before I could see it, I woke up and I'm in my pillow. Alarm's going off. 29 minutes had passed. And I remember just screaming, no, 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 no. This can't be true. Like I was just in the most glorious, realest thing. Like I felt more emotions. I felt more alive in heaven than I did on earth. But then as I woke up, I realized I didn't have the darkness within me. I didn't feel hollow anymore. There was a spark within me. And as a week or two passed, I realized I was fully healed of bedwetting and fully healed of celiac. When I woke up, I woke up a changed man. Some people, a few of the religious people thought I had a demon. They truly thought I was demon possessed. But the enemy cannot make you fall in love with reading the word of God. The en- the devil cannot make you want to bring other people to repentance. The enemy cannot make you want to pursue a holy lifestyle. And, and from that moment on, it, it, everything changed. A couple months later, I decided to leave. It was very painful because I, um, I, I've been taught and I've been bred to stay in these circles. And I love the people group that I was with, but God called me to move on. And I pray for the Hutterite groups, and I pray for the Mennonite groups that they would accept the Holy Spirit and to follow the design and the desire of God's heart in their life. Because I realize that our desires are placed there by God. And my message now is to activate people's dreams and desires to make that their full lifetime calling. Um, the Just to be really real with you, Sean, like my desire is to have an orphanage one day and I desire to have kingdom wealth. That's one of my that's one of my desires. But to clarify this, the reason I want to have an orphanage is because I know how much God loves children. He, I heard children in heaven, children that were not given a life here on earth, that were taken too early. They were living their best life in heaven. And I thought to myself, like when I woke up, I said, God, what do you want me to do? And as the years have passed, I've had a clear and clear vision of what I need to do. So now today, Jojo Morris spreads the love of Jesus through being a marketplace minister. I love to do business with people. I, uh, I do like monthly uh, content creating and social media managing now for a living, but I use those funds to channel it into the kingdom of God to help children that do not have a bright future. Instead, now I'm using these resources as a wise steward to take the talents that God has given me and to take the dirty money of this earth and change it into a glorious gold nugget for the kingdom of God. And so that brings me to today. Um, I'm passionate about spreading life and joy and activating people. What I do is I'll do a public speaking event and I'll have people stand up and share their dream publicly. 
and then we'll all take a moment to pray over them. And it's been really effective. So we're spearheading a new movement that's not supposed to be another cult. <laughs> it's here to spread life and love. And I do not think that I know it's not my job to go tear down where I came from. But I will build one of the tallest buildings in the kingdom alongside you, Destiny Image, by partnering with people that want to build up and become great instead of tearing down to be great. There's a there's much of a, a I'm diving into a deep topic here, but anyways, God's called me to build and to not tear down. And he's healed me of a bitterness in 2018. CJ Ellis, he is um he's a life coach out of uh, California. He was he's still my pastor today, but he has mentored me to knowing the father's heart more and more and teaching me that Jojo, you cannot let bitterness take a hold in your life or else it's going to sink your ship. And so God is uh, teaching me day by day. I daily seek his face. I am now married for almost two years. My wife, uh, her name's Emma. And God has brought a lot of kingdom contacts into my life. And it's my desire to grow the kingdom because as Sean, you know, life is short. Like this thing flies by so fast. It goes faster and faster. (laughs) <laughs> it's scary. I'm 26 and it feels like the last five years have just flown by. And so um, May 10th, 2017, I left and that's where I started a new life. And um, I prayed blessings over my parents. I loved them. They raised me the best they knew how. They came from broken homes and they did amazing with what was given them. And so I pray that God blesses the churches I used to grow up in. I do not desire to bash them. I pray they prosper. Um, Mennonites and Jews and Hudrites are some of the best business people I'll ever meet. And I'll, I'll still do business with them to this day, but I do not desire to tear them down. Um, so, well, no, God I, is, I, yeah. Fa- fa- um, fascinating just to kind of what, what you shared in terms of uh, being a, a builder, a, a person of, of building and creation and not tearing down and destruction. Um, you know, I, I think as, as any of us journey further on in life, whether it's, um, our family of origin or you know, businesses we are a part of or groups of people we're a part of, often the places where we were hurt the most, that God brings the most healing in our life, that's exactly the place God is going to call us to go back and do ministry to because mm. uh, because we are the walking exam- example of God redeeming the brokenness that came out of that system, out of that place. And so on the one hand, we you know if we're operating in a place of bitterness and hopelessness, um, you know, we're we're still holding on to that pain and that hurt and and the way we make ourselves feel better is by tearing tearing other people down and just speaking poorly of them and you know in our mind destroying that which hurt us so deeply um but yet at the same time as as we're healed and redeemed and you know I feel like when we're we're complaining and tearing down we're dealing with things on the outside because that hurt is so st- is still so deep on the inside um and as God transforms us from the inside out then we're able to be in a place where uh, we can go into those dark places that hurt us previously, and we can bring light and love and be that example of that redemption and he- and healing is is really available in Jesus. So I, I I love 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 yeah. love that aspect of your message. That's so cool. Thank you. Yeah, and one thing that just makes me so excited to live life is to run into other people and find out what they love to do. And so I don't know if uh, <laughs> I've already met you, but one of my first things that I'll always ask people is. What do you love doing? And it sort of throws people off because most people say, hey, what do you do for work? That's the number one thing. But that's not me. I might ask that, but like on plane rides and stuff, I'm always asking, what do you love to do? And that is something that God asks us. He's like, Sean, what do you love to do? Or, you know, for whoever's listening, he's he's asking you, like, what do you love to do? Because God wants to partner with his children. And for the longest time, I thought I was supposed to be a brain surgeon for like most of my life up until age 18. But then I realized that I was not allowed to go to college because college was of the world. And it broke me. It shattered me. But then I realized that God's called me to do heart surgery and brain surgery through speaking life into people. And it's just really cool how God works because he always takes something like the years that the locusts have eaten, he's restored that tenfold in my life. Like spiritually, mentally, physically, he's healed me. And also financially, he loves to just bless you on all levels. And if you're going through like a drought season right now, just know that God works in seasons and he shows us every single year that there's four main seasons, winter, spring, summer, and fall. 
So just know in Proverbs it says, in Proverbs it says, I forget what first, but it says, a wise son will know what season he's in, or a wise person you will be if you know what season you're in, depending on what version you read. But basically, you're a wise person if you understand the season that you're in. And I'm I'm starting to just go off the hook here, but <laughs> just understand that God has you in a season for a reason. So prepare and get ready for the blessing. I, I see that I I love the rhyming too, season <laughs> for a reason. That's that's oh. really good. Uh, well, even, but even in, in terms of, of calling and destiny, like I, I'm in my mid forties and I, I had a whole different career in tech and software before getting into publishing. Before I went down that path, I was on a, a pre-seminary ministry track. Um, and it, it is really interesting how, when we have those things, like, I feel like we see glimpses of it as we're growing up, those things where we're gifted or we just, we have a bent something second nature, you know, you'll encounter things whether it's in school or just somewhere in life, you're like, oh my gosh, it's like my mind was designed to to work this way. And so the, those are things you really have to take note of. Yeah. And there, there are so many shiny objects to get us off on this path or that path or out of practicality or out of a need, we'll go some other direction for a season. But I, I can say based on my own life experience, God will keep bringing those calling things back around. Often they don't look like what you thought they were in your teenage years and in your early 20s. Um, but those, those same things that God created you for will keep coming back around. Did I go into full-time pastoral ministry? No. It, 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 am I in a position now where my whole job focuses around um, mentoring, helping, encouraging leaders and pastors all over the world? Yes, that's that's my day-to-day -day job. So, you know, I, I would have never said, well, let me be kind of a sort of a pastor encourager behind the scenes to pastors. You know, I would have never... Uh, you know that what I do didn't exist because it's across podcasts and TV shows and working on books and and such and so you know, all that to say just the those calling destiny level things um, even when we get off the path I feel like God keeps bringing us back around you know there'll be if you're in a charismatic prophetic culture people will be praying things speaking things over you giving you words of knowledge be like you know ev ev eventually God will get your attention where random strangers that you meet at conferences be like, I just, I feel like I have something for you. And, and they'll like verbatim drop the same thing. The last five people have, have spoken over you, wow. people who don't know you. And so God, God will really try to get your attention. And, uh, you know, sometimes it, you'll feel like you'll, you can have gifts that, that like, God, how are you going to use this for the kingdom? Um, but God, God needs us to inject the kingdom in all spheres of society. Um, you know, a lot of times people will, They'll get saved and they'll be on fire and they'll be excited and everybody automatically seems to think I the only I, I really want to serve the church I need to be a pastor they think that being on that stage behind the pulpit is the only place God can use them if that's your calling pursue that with a reckless abandon but that's like yeah. the the one percent that's called to do that and be in that place yeah. and if you're called to be in business or whatever you know be an entrepreneur I don't I always tell people if, if be the best Christian sanitation worker, be the best Christian banker, coffee shop owner, entrepreneur, gas station clerk. I don't care what you do, however you want to earn a living, uh, but just, yeah. you know, bring the kingdom into all the spaces that you have influenced. And that, that really yeah. is it, what, what God is looking for us to do. You don't, you don't have to be a professional Christian to change the world. And, you know, if you look across yeah. church history in the early church, it was normal people living out their faith that impossibly, uh, transition to society a uh, society from paganism paganism into the christian faith and so normal yeah. people just doing life you know church is operating out of people's homes and so uh you know it, it you don't have to be a professional christian so to speak uh, to walk out your destiny and, so and change the world and i feel like i'm supposed to answer your question of what do, what do i like to do i yeah i, wanna, I was I, gonna I, ask you like what yeah. do you love to do sean uh you know honestly it's it's sort of this you know i I, for me, my joy is really helping other people tell their stories. And, you know, whether that's Ooh. in a podcast or helping people with a book proposal or a book project or, you know, coming up with a marketing strategy or, um, you know, I, it's just, it's, it's, a across all the different things that I've, I've done throughout my several careers, it feels like I've had, I've, I've learned how to tell stories and, and manage expectations and set things up. And so, um, that all that culminates into, into the season I'm in. And so, uh, yeah, I just, uh, so I, I really do spend a lot of time now in this season working with people like yourself and Randy and others who've had heaven experiences and hell experiences. How do we best tell your story and how do we be intentional about, about, um, putting it on display in a way that is going to impact the kingdom. That's going to lead people to Christ. That that's really, 
Uh, I spend a lot of time thinking about that right now. Um, also do a lot of conversations about uh, exorcisms and deliverance and other stuff. Completely different rabbit trail. But again, how do, how do we bring good th- sound teaching and good theology and, uh, you know, quality wisdom into those conversations? You know, because uh, as Randy and I have discovered, uh, not unlike the afterlife space, also kind of into that uh, demonic ghost hunting, everything else space. Uh, there's a lot of spiritual hunger in the world. The world, yeah. the devil will fill those spaces with a lot of interesting stuff to lead, lead people astray, get them off onto weird paths and tangents. And so I feel like, you know, if we're, if we're brave enough, uh, just, and I don't mean to go toe to toe with people, but just, are we brave enough to have conversations who believe differently than us? Can we be winsome and bring light and have a conversation with somebody who looks at deliverance or de- demonic activity from a different perspective or the afterlife from a different perspective? Yeah. Um, and you know, and, and, you know, for, if you're a content creator, you got a YouTube show, live streaming, a podcast, um, you know, I, my challenge would be to talk to people who are just far different from you. Some of the most powerful relationships yeah. that I never talk about are people I've met on the podcast. They write books that aren't even in the Christian space. And yet behind the scenes, there's a relationship happening there where we're friends. We communicate. Sometimes people reach out and say, Hey, I need you to pray for me and just things like that. Uh, but again, people I wouldn't normally talk to in my day to day. So, you know, you utilize these tools that you have, even to reach into people mm-hmm. who, are outside of your space or, you know, will it open a door for you to bring Christian conversations and ideas into a space where, you know, they don't have any Christian friends. And so for me, that context is podcasting. Um, But I feel like we're just in a season. If we want to be a part of relevant conversations and culture, uh, we have to be brave and put ourselves out there more than we're, we've maybe done in the past and just um, stand for, you know, stand for truth, stand on the uh, biblical foundations and, uh, certainly not not give up ground, you know, be, be, be very foundational on, on what we know to be truth and what's right. Um, but n- don't don't be afraid of the darkness. I feel like we've mm. we spent so much yeah. time hiding and afraid. You're like, oh, my gosh, that person's a this or that or the other thing. Um, he who is in you yeah. is stronger than he who's in the world. And so my whole uh, life, I was living in that fear, <laughs> like where literally we were not, we were so scared to go into the world because we were scared the world was going to influence us. So thank you for saying that. Well, and what, what's ironic, so you lived in a family church, cult, broad church culture for you, where that was like pounded into you day after day after day. Yet at the same time, people in the broader church culture outside of, say, your community, we're all living our life that same way, like it's being pounded into us day after day after day. Like we've, yeah. uh, you know, it's, we're, we're definitely in a space this past couple of years, uh, two to three years where um, you know, we've experienced like the teeny, teeny microscopic level of persecution here in the States in terms of the church and for the average Christian, yeah. um, but it's probably one of the healthiest things that could have happened to us in the sense that we have to wrestle with what, what does it mean to go to church? Um, if I don't get to go into my church building, am I, am I, do I still have a vibrant faith practice? Um, does my neighbor actually know, realize that I'm a Christian other than that? Now I don't even go to church on Sunday. Like, d- does it, you know, again, going back to uh, bringing the kingdom everywhere you have influence. Uh, just you know, yeah. Gas station, grocery store, uh, where, wherever you wherever you happen to go, uh, just yeah. just be a Christian in those spaces. So that was. A, I, I need uh, to say that, something. Yeah, please go ahead. Please. No, I was say this was a tangent that has nothing to do with you sharing your story, but we've ended up someplace interesting. <laughs> the crazy thing is, is I have a feeling that someone needs to hear this. And the thing is, is God is asking us to become marketplace ministers and to actually like. So I content create. That's what I do for a living. That's how we pay the bills. And now Sue, my wife works for Chick-fil-A. So like we have a partnership there where like it has given me opportunities to get in front of business owners and to speak with people. And unfortunately, most of the business owners in this world are under a ton of stress. And so when you can bring a refreshing, non-salesy approach where you're just actually wanting to genuinely pour life into their business, it's refreshing. It's like a cool breeze on a hot summer day. And so I'm asking God, every business that I approach, I'm asking God, how can I serve them? And a, a, a rabbi recently, I was watching a video and he said, stop asking for money. Start asking how you can serve God's children. And that's been my, that's been like the last two months I've switched everything to like, how can I serve God's children? And as of the last two months, a whole new business has been birthed out of filmmaking. It's just nuts. And the connections, Sean, that are just wild are flooding in and people are 
prospering because of that. And I'm building other people more than myself. And I'm just rising with them. I'm like finding out that when the water rises, the ships rise too. And so behind me, I want to explain this like X Menno. I would like my name to be taken off of it here within a year or two. I want it to be a platform that hosts fun stories of people that have gone through absolute awfulness and absolute how, and they've made it through by the grace of God and now are living victorious lives. So people that are just having a, a really bad day can go on there and get a shot of hope. <laughs> As my friend Ben Corson says, we're hope dealers. <laughs> Well, yes, we definitely need to be out there uh, slinging more hope in, in society, uh, as you might say. But the, the reality is uh, the world's looking for solutions and answers. And the reality is uh, we have access to all the answers in the universe. And, uh, you know, yeah. it, it might feel kind of weird because we're, we're so used to living these compartmentalized lives where our faith is something that happens on Sunday, you know, maybe in the morning or in, in the evening behind closed doors. And uh, maybe you've just been afraid to uh, walk out your faith in the world and in the marketplace. Yet, uh, I, lo- I love how you ju- you described how your business has changed, where God's challenging you just to serve His kids and bring them solutions. Yeah. And I, I love you know, and that's just a, I feel like that's just a common grace principle of how God set up the world. The rising tide raises all ships. But in terms of like really serving other people well, um, that uh, and that always opens other doors that you don't expect your, your best clients, your best business opportunities come from warm referrals of people that you've already served. Um, some of, some of your worst clients will come from yellow pages and paid advertising and, and, you know, not that they're all bad, but just, I think of the many different business contexts I've been in through the years. And, uh, I, I worked, uh, for an onsite service company in Florida for a year with some of my, uh, my, my, one of my best friends, who's like a brother, we worked for his brother in Florida for a time. And, um, you know, some of the really challenging clients would be like, was that a yellow pages client? And like, actually, yes, they called the phone number from the ad and, and, you know, and so, uh, but it's just, uh, the, the, uh, when you serve other people, well, uh, it, it, God will use it to open up doors and unexpected things. It's like, uh, when you have favor with that one person, it, it keeps transferring to something better, uh, and keeps, it keeps going and keeps going. And so, uh, I, I think, I think really what you're pressing into is a way that God is shifting Mark marketplace ministry, um, kingdom principles in business where um, God is really looking to for us to live out our faith and bring Holy Spirit fueled solutions out into the world. Again, we're used to compartmentalizing it and keeping our our faith small kind of in it from an 80 20 perspective. It impacts 20 percent of our life and the other 80 percent is us is us just doing our thing. What if we uh, position ourselves for like, God, I'm I'm going to yield and I'm not going to give you 20 percent anymore. I'm going to give you 100 percent. So I want to I want to pray into everything that I have going on before I go into that meeting. I'm going to stop and I'm going to pray and ask that the Holy Spirit, that you would lead me into where I should go. Help me to be discerning and not, not get lost in the weeds and hear like what's really behind what they're saying. What's behind what, what somebody's expressing and just, uh, you know, I think that could transform the, transform the way you, you do your life, business, family, everything uh, could be different, but it, it's really just a yielding, giving that up. Uh, because, you know, again, it's out of that self-protection place where you want to hold it close and, uh, you know, uh, almost like we're, we're afraid that, uh, it's, it's kind of that tyrannical God that you, you talked about, uh, being raised with. And then when you saw God, who, who God really was, it like the scales came off here. I was like, oh, this God's really for me. And in this, and in that same way, God wants to be for us in all the areas, not just on Sunday, not just when we're praying in the morning or in the evening. And so. I guess if you hear anything from this conversation, uh, one, be encouraged by JoJo's story because we went this totally other direction. Um, But two, I think think just the takeaway is uh, to be willing to step out in faith and just ask God to guide and direct your steps in everything, as opposed to just the the smaller group of things that you've yielded. And and if you take us up on that challenge, we want to hear about it. So leave a comment, send us a note. Jojo, it's been a windy conversation. I don't even know where we were trying to end up at this point, but um, in, in, in terms of like your story, your journey, you know, I find working with people to, to share about heaven encounters and hell encounters, people will often fixate on oh, some, some one thing and they'll get stuck there. Uh, so, you know, on this side of it, you know, we, we've talked about your journey, how it transformed you. Uh, you've demonstrated in terms of stories, how God's actually transformed how you do business and do life, you know, serving throughout culture. Um, 
Like, what's the takeaway? Any any time you share, what do you hope every single person hears from your story? That is one of the best questions I've heard in a, a while. Thank you for asking that. Wow, thank you, Jesus. The biggest takeaway that I feel is that God is a righteous God and that he wants and desires a personal relationship with every single one of his children here on earth. And we're all made in the likeness of God. And he, if you are going through like a dark time, just know that God is trying to get a hold of you. And he's wanting you to know that he cares for you. And that if you're trying to find God, the best way to do is just to cry out in your moment of desperation and say, God, I need you. And he will answer. Just got to keep your eyes open. It might show up through a text message. It might show up through a, something in the Bible. It might show up through a, you know, a close friend talking to you. But to know this, that God is actively seeking how he can inspire his children to live purpose-filled lives here on earth. That's my biggest takeaway. And once we even understand 1% of 1% of how much God loves us, we'll be undone with that amount of information in our minds. Because it's like a he, he, he will give everything to be with you. And so now as I do, my, as I do business, as I love on my wife, and hopefully in the future, my, my children, I know this, that God sees our steps. And he's not a, a God that's going to strike you with a lightning bolt. And if it's time for someone to go, just know that where they're going is way better than here. And um, that's probably my biggest takeaway. That he's a forgiving God. And he wants you to actually succeed. Yeah. That's, that's like my simple answer explained. <laughs> perfect. Perfect. That, that's a good place to land the conversation. Uh, Jojo, in terms of people connecting with you, ministry stuff, business stuff, how, how do we discover you? How do we find you on the web? Yeah. I mean, type in xmenno.com. xmenno.com is the best way. All the links are in there. Um, I do know that God has placed in my heart to be financially wise and steward the resources that he's given me. People have been very generous, but I do ask, like, pray before you give. Just don't give out of obligation. Really say, and Holy Spirit, how do you want me to partner with you know, Jojo's ministry, because this is not just my ministry. We are impacting a wide group of people, orphanages, mission groups, we're sponsoring things. And so we're, you're seeing the beginning stages of an incredible movement. And so pray and ask God, like, I desire your prayers first. I, I would like prayer warriors, an army of prayer warriors, because that will move mountains more than money will. But money is the fuel. We put money in the gas tank and we go. So it's really exciting. x is a, a platform for people to really just get encouraged. And so watch it get transformed. We do have a media company that's x Media that Media uh, that, that funds it currently. And that's been really fun to see develop, you know. So that's where people can get in contact with me and uh, go from there. If you need encouragement, reach out. I'm very accessible right now on social media. Just message me. I'll pray for you. I send prayer messages all the time to people. <laughs> Well, and I'll, and I'll say, Jojo, enjoy the season when you can be accessible because you, 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 you'll get, I, I, I can definitely see just based on getting to know you a little bit and the trajectory you're on. That, that is really the hardest thing is as what God gives you to steward grows, you can't give to everybody individually the same way you could at the start. And it's super hard. Yeah. It, and it, that's, that's just part of growing and taking on more responsibility. And so then you have to put in other people and other systems to still serve at that really quality level. It's just you. Because the because everything gets to be so big, you just can't do it all yourself. So it's a good thing. It, it's it's growth. So uh, just just enjoy the time when you can be the guy like on the front line serving. Uh, otherwise, you'll have to have like sub JoJo's in the future helping you out with some of those things you can't yeah. do anymore. Well, and, and I, I, I love how the, to clone myself. Yeah, <laughs> just kidding. <laughs> <laughs> Not literally. That's a whole different conversation. Yeah, um, please no. I, I love I love that. On the one hand, you said, "Hey, if you want to." uh donate so into what we're doing you gave that option but also i love that you gave a call to prayer because it's easy to give money and and like jojo said yes money fuels ministry money pays bills um and and, you know god multiplies gifts that you give to ministries uh but at the same time um prayer actually costs you something in a way that's far different from money it's always easy to give money it's harder to pray for people we we often say i'll pray for you and then we don't do it and we or we forget we just get too busy and so uh, you know, my, my challenge would be if, if God's prompting you, please so into what Jojo's doing. Uh, but even more than that, you know, be challenged to 
write his name down in your prayer journal and just be lifting him up and the work he's doing uh, on a regular basis. Because again, you know, giving him that prayer coverage that that does so much more in the kingdom than you ever realize. You know, when we have people praying for us all over the globe, uh, the darkness that that pushes back, uh, I think, has results that you're only going to see uh, when you're in heaven. So, you know, if you're if you feel led, please give. But even more so, be challenged to lift him up in prayer on a regular basis. That's going to open more doors than your money ever will. Uh, Jojo, yeah. man, this has been a super crazy, windy conversation. We were going to talk about your afterlife experience. And then we got into like kingdom business principles and what I like to do and what you like to do. So uh, I don't even, I have no idea how to even title this interview. It's like uh, near death experiences, afterlife encounters and Christian kingdom business principles or something. I don't, I don't know what we'll call it, but uh, yeah. it'll be, it'll be awesome uh regardless uh yeah i don't know i I was like can i even use my normal closing i i will just so i feel like i'm on point uh sadly it is time to bring this episode of the sean tavit show to a close uh many thanks for being a part of this conversation today with jojo morris uh once again if you want to connect with him so into his ministry find out what he's doing head over to xmeno.com that's x-m-e-n-n-o.com jojo i want to say thank you so much for sharing with us today it's been an honor and a pleasure to have you on the show Thank you so much. May the Lord bless you and prosper you as well.